It's an honour to welcome Professor Sharon Peacock of the University of Cambridge, a truly outstanding recipient of the Marjorie Stevenson Prize 2023. The Marjorie Stevenson Prize is named after the Society founding member and former president, Marjorie Stevenson, and is awarded to an individual who has made exceptional contributions to the discipline of microbiology. Sharon's scientific expertise includes pathogen genomics, antimicrobial resistance, and a range of tropical diseases. She was the founding director of COG UK, the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, formed in April 2020 to provide SARS-CoV-2 genomes to UK public health agencies, National Health Service, and researchers. Generating information on variants proved vital for their detection and tracking, and for studies of viral transmissibility, immune evasion, and disease severity. Today, we are lucky enough to hear Sharon's lecture, Sequencing Microbes for Better Human Health. Well, Sharon. Well, what a pleasure to be here. And um, I have to say that five years ago, pretty much the day I was standing here in this lecture theatre for the Microbiology Society, having been awarded the Translational Prize uh, for Microbiology. And what I would say is, um, looking back to five years, it's quite incredible what we've achieved in microbiology and virology in the last five years. And I'm going to try and reflect that today. You know, in particular, I never would have dreamed in my sort of wildest dreams what microbiologists, virologists, and other scientists actually achieved during the pandemic. So that was a tragic time for many people. But actually, for scientists, it really did uh, uh, propel our research forward. And for genomics, it has been an incredible stimulus to think that genomics, pathogen genomics, could actually come into clinical practice um, uh, now. So I'm going to be looking quite broadly at sequencing microbes for better human health. And I'm going to be talking about uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, but also extending it out. And what I'm going to do, oh, that's my slide where I'm giving the, uh, the translational uh, microbiology lecture five years ago. What I'm going to be doing is really taking a bird's eye view of what you can use microbial sequencing for, and so it's quite a high-level view, but it's also a great celebration, a celebration of scientists in the last five years, what we've achieved in that time. So I'm going to be looking at existing use cases. In particular, I'm going to look at genome sequencing in relation to vaccines, uh, active surveillance and outbreaks, and diagnostics and therapeutics. And then I'm going to be speculating about what next. And what I've done today is I've put together what I would consider four hot topics so if you're thinking about genomics and you're not sure what areas to go into, I hope that you'd be uh, suitably fired up by the hot topics that I mentioned here today. Let's start with vaccines then. Now, in the uh, top, uh, top left-hand corner here is, if I can get my pointer to work. Never mind, top left-hand corner, you'll see a tweet. That tweet was by Eddie Holmes, who uh, works in Sydney, and he was working in collaboration with uh, Chinese colleagues, um, and uh, uh, that was a tweet to say that he just released the first SARS-CoV-2 genome um, into uh, a virological. Now, that was a genome generated by uh, his Chinese colleagues, uh, Fan Wu and others, and it was of a, a virus that had been obtained from a patient who went into the central hospital of Wuhan on the 26th of December 2019. Now, they had uh, severe respiratory syndrome with fever, dizziness, and cough. And metagenomic sequencing of a bronchoalveolar lavage demonstrated a new RNA virus strain from the family uh, Corinoviridae. Now, in this slide, what you'll see at the top is a schematic of the figure that they produced in their paper. So in this figure, you'll see um, in the top is the Wuhan human one coronavirus strain uh, compared with a bat SARS-like coronavirus in the middle and a coronavirus associated with humans at the bottom. And you'll see that they are very similar. 
Now, this first genome that was produced was absolutely critical for vaccine development that came very quickly afterwards. And we had a very detailed knowledge here of the full-length spike protein. This was a particularly important uh, area of the virus to be uh, concerned with when talking ab about the immunology, uh, because this is... Uh, the, as you know, the part of the virus that interacts with the human, uh, the human receptor, uh, ACE2 receptor, and it's what our immune system is largely uh, 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 mounted to. So, based on that first viral genome, then uh, in addition, of course, to decades of research for mRNA vaccines and the Oxford uh, vaccine group, what we had in this country was was extraordinarily quick vaccine uh, development uh, for this particular virus. So you'll see here the two announcements, one for the mRNA vaccine uh, on the 2nd of December 2020. And talking about scientific innovation, there had never been an mRNA vaccine in humans before. And June Rain and her colleagues in MRHA, uh, MRHA uh, uh, processed that through um, in, in uh, rapid time. And then, of course, uh, the Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine. And I'm not, just, not saying that genomics you know, was, um, was the only thing that contributed to that, but it clearly was a critical part of the, of the puzzle. Not only was it important in the vaccine uh, uh, design itself, uh, appreciating that the, the spike protein was going to be the target for vaccines, but in addition to that, genomes subsequently informed vaccine redesign. So we all know that the, uh, once the virus emerged, it began to change through mutation. And uh, what you'll see here on this uh, structural uh, representation of the spike protein of the Omicron variant, this shows the number of different changes, uh, the uh, amino acid substitutions that took place in this spike compared to the original virus. Now, this represents quite a different spike to the spike of the Wuhan, uh, uh, the original Wuhan virus. And therefore, uh, this was used uh, by Moderna to develop the spike vax booster, which was actually a sequenced informed a redesign. And it was a bivalent vaccine, which had two variants, the original Wuhan and Omicron. Clinical trial data showed that the bivalent vaccine triggered strong immune responses against both the Omicron and the original strain. So again, genomes informing vaccine design and redesign. I've given you one further example of where sequencing can inform vaccine efficacy over time, and this is in the case of Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, this um, it causes, uh, as you know, otitis media, uh, sinusitis. It can cause, is a common cause of community-acquired pneumonia and uh, meningitis. Now, it's classified into serotypes based on the polycapsular um, uh, the polysaccharide capsular antigens on the surface, and there are more than 90 uh, immunologically distinct serotypes in, 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 in for this species. Now, the polysaccharide co conduit vaccine targets the most common cause of, of, of strep pneumonia infection that's circulating in the community. But there's a problem with that because the vaccines then drive selection of uh, uh, serotypes that are not in the vaccine. And so this particular initiative is uh, the Global Pneumococcal Sequencing Project is a worldwide genomic survey of the impact of vaccination on the pathogen population. Now, what you'll see here is work, very nice work from David Cleary and colleagues down in Southampton. And this really demonstrates how you can use sequencing uh, to inform a future vaccine design in, in addition to serotyping. And so what you'll see here is the results of an annual cross-sectional uh, surveillance study of pneumococcal carriage in Southampton children less than five years each winter between uh, 2006 and 2018. Now, the serotypes in this figure are grouped by inclusion in the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So uh, the uh, PCV7 uh, uh, targets uh, seven uh, serotypes and the PCV13 obviously targets 13. So in this figure here, you'll see that, the, well, certainly the PCV7 was introduced in around 2006. And this line here is the cause of, of carriage uh, at that point. And you can see that following the vaccine introduction, there was a reduction uh, from more than 50% right the way down uh, following uh, the, the vaccine rollout. Now, you'll also see in uh, uh, PCV13 serotypes, which is in the blue, 
from a high of 20%, this dropped following the introduction of the PCV13 vaccine. So what we need to do then, really, is to understand the circulating serotypes that there are of pneumococci and chase those uh, as uh, the, um, the serotypes are selected out by the vaccination. So moving on to active surveillance then, and I'm going to look at pandemics, um, in particular the SARS-CoV-2, together with outbreaks. Now, when SARS-CoV-2 emerged, it was a fit virus from day one. In particular, its uh, basic reproductive number was around 2.8, and so an infected person would infect around three other people uh, who they came into contact with. In addition, there was virus shedding before symptoms began, which was not appreciated initially, and a proportion of infected people had no symptoms, and so people could spread this virus very rapidly. So this was a fit virus. However, RNA viruses have high mutation rates, up to a million times higher than humans, and genetic changes in the virus could lead to enhanced viral fitness through a process of natural selection. Basically, the fittest virus will win out and outrun the others. So going back to this uh, uh, figure of uh, the virus of the, gen uh, of the, the genome of the virus, uh, the genome is around 29,000 bases, you'll see here that uh, the spike protein in particular is the area we're focusing in. But mutations can happen anywhere along that genome. And what is the outcome of that? Well, most mutations have no effect on the virus at all. Some will disadvantage the virus, and that will uh, probably become extinct and uh, will not be observed. A small number of mutations will be advantageous to the virus, and that may result in lineage expansion. So the three things we learned during the, the pandemic was the ABC of variant assessment. Rather like airways breathing circulation, the three questions was, if a variant emerged, was it more transmissible? Did it escape our immune system? And could it cause more severe disease? And this is why we needed to do pathogen sequencing. So that we could categorize those viruses, understand where the mutations were occurring in the genome, and link that to biological behavior. Looking at the genome alone will not tell you how the virus is going to behave. But if you can link the viral genome with biological behavior, for example, expansion um, uh, in a population, as we saw with alpha, the alpha variant, then that is how you start to understand the behavior of the virus. Now, we formed uh, uh, the COG UK, uh, or COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. And you can see here on the map that it actually had numerous uh, settings or, or hubs across the country. We had 16 regional sequencing sites um, and the four public health agencies of the United Kingdom, together with a large sequencing capability at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. We were also heavily dependent on CLIME, which was, is the cloud uh, infrastructure for uh, microbial bioinformatics, which had already been funded by the MRC and set up, but we were critically dependent on that for our genomes and project administration was in Cambridge. Now, we were uh, amongst the first to develop a capability to generate SARS-CoV-2 genomes at scale and use this for uh, public health impact. And we showed in the UK, beyond doubt actually, that sequencing could generate actionable information uh, and support to support an effective response. How did it happen? How was it that we could develop a consortium with around 600 volunteers uh, to help run sequencing across the country. This is a, a really a kind of a timeline of March 2020. You'll see the blue running across the middle, which is the, the calendar days. The red blocks are the number of diagnostic tests that were positive for COVID-19. And if you remember back then, there was limited testing capability. The green blocks underneath the line are the number of genomes that were sequenced. So how did COG UK actually come about? Well, it came about with a phone call. So I picked up, the, I, I emailed five colleagues to say, we're going to need to do genome sequencing, I think, aren't we? And so I said, please ring me. And the five colleagues uh, uh, rang and they said, we do need to do the sequencing. We're going to have to track down changes in the virus. And at the same time, uh, Patrick Vallance and Chris Whitty were very supportive and knew that this was going to be an important pandemic response capability, which we didn't have. We had the component parts, but we didn't have something stitched together. 
So I organised a meeting at the Wellcome Trust where I, we, 20 colleagues came together to talk about a blueprint for how COG UK would be. Now, if you think back to the last grant you wrote, you probably spent weeks or months writing it. We actually got together in the course of a day and, dis and described a blueprint for how we would sequence uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, where we would do it, who would do it. We had about two days to write the, the full uh, application for £14.5 million, pounds, uh, which went to Patrick Valance um, by the middle of the month. We got sequencing underway with various teams uh, looking at, think, at, at areas such as sample collection, method development, uh, linking uh, genome data to metadata. And by the two-thirds way through March, we had our first report to SAGE. Uh, importantly, as I've already mentioned, we, uh, there was a creation of Climb COVID to store our data and do the analysis, and then we finally got going on the 1st of April. Now, what this taught me really in terms of lessons was you actually have to um, be quite bold, and so we had to say this is what's needed. There was no evidence that it would be needed yet, but we had to go and ask the government for a large amount of money, and we just got on and did it. So speed was important. Uh, and uh, just taking the initiative was very important. And this turned out to be the most extraordinary partnership. Um, we had 21 different uh, partners all across the country who all signed up to this legal and data sharing agreement, so we worked together as one. I believe that this is the first time that the four public health agencies of the United Kingdom work seamlessly together to share data and work across the country to look at uh, the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Now, this is a map of the sequencing network that we developed. So we had uh, our sequencing hubs. We were networked with 100 NHS testing labs and the Lighthouse Lab. So this shows you the network for patients for Pillar 1. And what you'll see here, for example, if you look at the light blue, which is Northum Northumbria University sequencing hub, you can see that that really um, uh, covered the whole area in the kind of the, that, that part of the country. Uh, if you look down uh, here... Uh, uh, in the in the southwest, you can see that um, Exeter, Portsmouth, were very important, as was uh, Port and Down. So this is how we did our sequencing, and then everything was centralised in our CLIMB database. Now, the Welcome Sanger Institute was really important for uh, our community testing. Now, you remember that these were set up very high scale testing uh, for people in the community. And basically, Welcome Sanger Institute described the fact that they were like a, a waste disposal uh, unit initially because they would get the 96 world plates from PCR testing, including the negatives and the positives. They would be shipped down to the Sanger, and there the positives would be cherry-picked out and sequenced. So this is how our network worked. We also had a very uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, approach to devolving innovation and operations. And so we had um, different responsibilities. So operations and logistics sat in Cambridge with me. Methods development really sat with the, Ar the excellent Arctic network, which is already working before the pandemic came along. Data and metadata was via Klein COVID. And analysis tools, many of those were developed in um, Edinburgh and Glasgow. So what did we find? This is one of my favourite images of, of, uh, of variants over time. Uh, it doesn't go right to the end of the pandemic, you'll note, but it's actually from MicroReact, David Anderson's work in Oxford. And what you'll see here is the very early part of uh, the pandemic, right here in March 2020, going right the way through to, uh, uh, into 2022. And the fascinating thing is that when in wave one, there were a very large number of variants circulating. And in fact, at the time the alpha variant emerged, there were around 230 different variants circulating during that month. And none of them were particularly able to outcompete the others. So each color here is uh, a variant, uh, and the proportion is up to 100%. Into wave two, a particular variant appeared, which appeared to be displacing other variants, and it was, it was called B1177 there, but we called it the summer holiday variant. This emerged in Europe and was picked up by uh, uh, people from the UK and brought back during their, 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 after their holidays. And this led to a, a large expansion in cases. And so at this point, I guess it's a, a, about 30% of all cases was the summer holiday variant. But there was nothing special about this. So we were, we were observing this um, and wondering at what point we would see something that came next, which is in the green. This is the alpha variant. 
So you'll see here, in a, there's a very, very small number of around, well, there were six isolates out of 16,000 in September. That number started to build up slowly. And what you'll see here is it completely wiped away the other variants. So natural selection in the alpha variant was more transmissible, and it actually replaced everything. Um, it swept the others aside, and then, of course, you'll see that Delta came in. So this is what our technology was waiting for, really, so that we could categorize the variants, and with that categorization, say, is alpha variant more transmissible than what came before? Does it cause more severe disease than what came before? And is it going to escape our immune system? And, what, and you'll be familiar with this figure. It doesn't go right to the end of the pandemic. But what you'll see is that after initial noise of many other variants, there was wave after wave of variants that were fitter than the last variant, largely due to their increased transmissibility. Now, this is a beautiful figure, actually, which looks at the relative fitness of SARS-CoV-2 variants over time. And um, on this axis, you've got um, the fold increase in relative fitness compared with the Wuhan lineage. And on the uh, x-axis, you've got the date of lineage emergence. The size of the circle is proportional to the cumulative case count. So you'll see here that uh, the pink is a uh, variant of concern, or red is variant of concern. So what you'll see here is uh, alpha. Uh, and then as we go up through delta and into Omicron, there is a massive increase in uh, relative fitness compared to Wuhan over time. And you can see Omicron really sits out there um, on its own. So an incredible increase in fitness over time. Right, so I'm, I've, I've uh, talked about, um, uh, about pandemics and uh, in particular SARS-CoV-2. But now I'm going to talk briefly about how we use sequencing for other applications Pandemics are urgent situations, but what we have to realize is that community outbreaks and those in hospitals are endemic and going on all the time. Now, I'd like to start with this figure. Back in 2011, we didn't have genomics that we could apply routinely to foodborne pathogens. And if you cast your mind back, there was a severe um, uh, E. coli outbreak across Europe. And clinicians started to put together uh, information in different hospitals that there were more people coming in with something called hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, which is uh, basically a kidney failure because of a gastroenterological infection than they'd seen before. Now, if you look at the epidemic curve here, you'll see that the outbreak was identified just as the epidemic peaked. And specific surveillance wasn't initiated until the peak was coming down. Now, this in 2011, this wouldn't happen now, and that's because uh, foodborne pathogens are routinely sequenced and their genomes are compared to see if an outbreak is occurring. At this time, uh, at the end of this pandemic, some, some uh, genomics was applied to this, but it was too late to really help uh, with this outbreak. So the example I'm going to show you here is a community outbreak, which is a wonderful demonstration of how our public health agencies keep us safe from uh, foodborne outbreaks. Now, this is relating to listeria. It's a relatively old outbreak now, but listeria is a bacterium that mostly goes unnoticed when we consume it, but it is serious for particular people who are uh, immunocompromised and also for pregnant women. Now, it's, uh, it's a serious infection in those individuals, and it can cause meningitis and bloodstream infection. And the mortality rate is up to 30%. Now, if we look at this figure over here, it's the annual cases and crude incidence rate of listeriosis over time. And on average, we get about 166 cases of listeriosis in this country every year, with about 46 related deaths per year. So, there was nine cases of listeriosis in seven locations um, between April and June 2019. The fact that there were so few wouldn't really uh, raise your eyebrows. And, and, you know, was it a chance observation? You can see here on the map where these locations were. Fortunately, our public health agency, they sequence these isolates absolutely routinely. So we have the first two patients here who developed listeriosis. And PHE, at that time called PHE, performed genome sequencing on the listeria isolates. And in fact, they were related, highly related. They were uh, almost identical. A third patient developed listeriosis, and three isolates were related. 
And then a big investigation goes, uh, uh, it goes into play, because actually these are people in hospital who appear to have acquired listeriosis whilst they were inpatients. Uh, Public Health England tracked this down to uh, sandwiches that had been uh, uh, put together in a factory and then shipped to many different hospitals for patients that could buy, buy them for lunch. And what was discovered was that um, the sandwiches were withdrawn, but isolates from those sandwiches were the same as the isolates from the patient. So what you see here in hindsight, the blue is the sandwich uh, uh, production or distribution network and the red are the cases. So PHE were able to say there is a listeriosis outbreak related to sandwich distribution, and they brought it to a rapid close. This is the power of foodborne outbreak detection using routine sequencing. You don't wait for a signal for an outbreak because actually you'll pick it up much earlier if you're sequencing these pathogens routinely. So this idea of sequencing of foodborne outbreaks, it's really reached a consolidated position here in the US, in, in Europe, um, in, uh, 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 in the UK. You can see here the reports that have been published uh, by the WHO, uh, by the FDA, and by ECDC. And what they're really saying is that sequencing has become the new normal for uh, foodborne outbreak uh, detection and investigation. So where are we with hospital outbreaks? We've clearly embedded uh, 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 community outbreaks, uh, sequencing in community outbreaks, but what about hospital outbreaks? I'm sorry to say it isn't quite as advanced as, uh, uh, as that, but it's getting there. So what I'd like to do now is turn your attention to how hospital outbreak detection actually occurs. What happens here is that there's a surveillance process where daily lists of patients with indicator organisms, such as MRSA, are reviewed by infection control. If you have two cases positive for the same indicator organism and the overlap in time and place, that's when an investigation begins. So the infection control team will go to the ward, uh, and there may be an investigation, and sometime down the line there may be some bacterial typing, uh, and that will lead to actions to contain further spread. Now, what sequencing can do can actually completely truncate this process so that basically this whole business of surveillance is replaced by bacterial sequencing combined with epidemiological analysis. And in fact, it truncates it in this very first part of the pathway. It's genomic surveillance. Now, this is a, a, an incredible a, a boost to infection control, which is described by the study here, which looked at the value of sequencing MRSA when combined with standard outbreak investigation on a special care baby unit. Now, in this outbreak, uh, there were three infants with MRSA carriage. They're shown here in, in, in the black bars. And uh, that, at the time, triggered a major investigation and a six-month look back for other cases. And at that point, there was not enough evidence for an outbreak. What you'll see here is a timeline for these infants going right the way back to uh, uh, six months previously. The length of the black bar is their admission date. Um, there's also gaps between these uh, uh, babies in the, in the sort of somewhat darker blue uh, bars. And so what we did was we sequenced those MRSA isolates. And we found in this phylogenetic tree here that they were all related. So this outbreak had been going on for six months. There was strong evidence for an outbreak, but in fact, infection control hadn't been able to pick it up for two reasons. One is that they, they, they thought that these were independent clusters that were not going over the entire span of the six months. Two, the antibiograms of those first three isolates weren't a match, and that was being used as a surrogate for genetic relatedness, but actually it wasn't accurate. And so that outbreak was actually missed. And if you had sequenced those first three infants MRSA, you would know there was an outbreak going on. What we then did, actually, was to see whether this MRSA outbreak had extended beyond the special care baby unit. And for this, we went to our diagnostic laboratory, and we actually sequenced around 20 isolates that were uh, uh, available at around the same time. And what we found was that 10 were actually related to the special care baby unit outbreak. You can see here... Uh, there's a, a symbol for uh, uh, male, female, and baby. 
but we didn't know the epidemiology. We knew the time that they were taken, but we didn't know the epidemiology and the link to these babies in special care baby unit until we went to the notes. And what we found, and this is really a very elegant demonstration of um, a molecular uh, sort of uh, a genetic linkage. Uh, it's um, what you'll see here. First of all, over here, the, um, the phylogenetic tree, you can see where, for example, identical, uh, for example, this green pair is a mother and a baby. And you'll see here that actually there's been linkages, for example, from a baby to their mother, uh, to their father. You can see linkages between a parents in the maternity ward who'd initially screened negative. So this level of granularity you will want in your hospital. You will want to introduce this to better understand, for example, MRSA transmission, multi-drug resistant gram negatives, etc. Unfortunately, sequencing is not devolved yet. And what we need to do is to think about how we embed genomics into local outbreak capabilities. In particular, we have some work to do yet. We have to optimize workflows. We need to standardize a credit and get reproducibility of this. We need to do this in a fast enough time to be able to take action, and that really requires a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. We also need to think about costs and expertise we really need a report to uh, infection control users, for example, that does not rely on expert bioinformatics skills. So my next uh, category for existing capabilities is around diagnostics and therapeutics. And this is really about personalized medicine through targeted prescribing for your patients. Now, going back in time, um, actually personalized treatment informed by pathogen genomics got a major boost from the UK 100,000 Genome Project started in 2012, announced by David Cameron. And what, what this program did was actually the CMO, Sally Davis, set up three working groups uh, to look at what would be sequenced for the 100,000 Genome Project. Uh, there was a working group on cancer, one on rare diseases, and one on pathogen genomes, which uh, I chaired. We considered what we would recommend for sequencing, and uh, we... Um, what we recommended in this summary is HIV, deep sequencing to detect rare variants that were, were resistant, uh, hepatitis C and tuberculosis. Now, looking back, that was really instrumental because although um, the 100,000 Genome Project has largely been uh, uh, focused, at least in the media, on human sequencing, um, this, this boost for pathogen sequencing was such that uh, Public Health England was asked to take on the sequencing development uh, following our recommendations. And I have to say that, that they have done a very good job. So, for example, we were one of the first countries in the world to develop TB sequencing. So all cases of TB in this country have their isolates sequenced. Uh, and that's used for uh, um, prediction of uh, drug treatment uh, early on, uh, which is faster than culture, but also outbreak investigation. And so if you're interested in this, uh, there's a TB action plan for England, uh, 2011, uh, 2021 to 2026. And in this uh, sample journey, what you'll see here is that following the sample um, uh, acquisition, uh, that goes for sequencing. Um, and there's a report about what drugs to treat that patient with um, and relatedness of that isolate with others. So, in fact, in this country, we are really pioneers in the sequencing of TB. The other thing that we do, uh, we do well um, is, um, and, and this is kind of gold standard really now for treatment of HIV in those countries that can do sequencing, is personalised treatment for HIV. So on the right here, you'll see a screen grab uh, from an HIV drug resistance database uh, from Stanford. Uh, but on the left, how we treat people uh, with HIV. And so there's an assumption that you have drug-resistant testing at entry to care. Um, and if therapy is, is deferred, you will have uh, repeat testing. And then if you have a suspected uh, anti-retroviral anti, uh, therapy um, resistance, then you will have further testing. So again, uh, we, we, are, we are using this routinely now for personalized treatment. And finally, in terms of diagnostics, we did use the COVID-19 sequence data for SARS-CoV-2 to look at how to use our monoclonal antibodies. 
So this really informed the use of that drug. Uh, and this is a screen grab from the COG UK Me website, where we looked at the fold reduction in neutralization by monoclonal antibodies for circulating variants and single mutations over time. This allowed people to understand, not necessarily for individual patients, but it actually showed uh, the fold reduction in neutralization um, for uh, any given variant. So for example, uh, Omicron here, you can see that it, this, this drug would not be necessarily effective uh, if given to patients infected with Omicron. So what next? Well, what I'd like to mention is really four hot topics. And these are the topics that I think are particularly exciting in the field of genomics. Much has been done, but these would be the area that I think if I was starting out in this field now, I'd be very keen to uh, consider contributing to. The first is global TB sequencing. Now, we know that, uh, that TB is a major killer uh, across the world. And this is particularly exciting because although we know how to do sequencing after culturing a bacterium, what would be much more powerful would be to sequence the specimen itself and not actually have to culture the isolate. So there are several commercial offerings that exist this end-to-end -end solution for targeted next-generation sequencing. So targeted means you don't culture uh, the pathogen. You can see here that you go from sputum to DNA extraction to library prep and then on to sequencing and data analysis, targeted sequencing, targeting the drug resistance genes. Now, we know that there are several commercial offerings, and what the WHO have done is they have issued a public call for data to provide evidence on the performance of these, uh, of these offerings. And in particular, they're looking for a lock-designed product from DNA extraction to the final report with an interpretation, uh, interpreted sequencing result of resistant, susceptible, or uncertain. Now, the exciting thing is that actually this is being uh, uh, tested um, in, uh, in uh, low- and middle-income countries. And the joy of this, as you can see from this figure, is that if you do phenotypic testing, it will take a great deal of time, weeks or months, to get your susceptibility testing finished. If you do whole genome sequencing at the moment, you're still reliant on culture right here, which takes several weeks. With targeted sequencing, you've got your result in two to three days. Now, these are, these, this is a figure from uh, uh, Swapna uh, Uplikar, who works at FIND, and uh, she, FIND are, have a seek and treat uh, program, and they are looking at this technology, and I really do think it would be a paradigm shift, leading uh, to uh, much more rapid uh, detection of drug-resistant TB. So that's hot topic number one. I think hot topic number two is metagenomics to improve diagnosis and treatment of individual patients. So there are many studies that have used uh, metagenomics in a research setting to see if we can simply sequence in an agnostic way what is in a sample from a patient. This is work by Michael Wilson and colleagues uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the question they asked was, um, if you take people coming into hospitals with suspected infectious meningitis or encephalitis, does um, uh, non-biased sequencing, metagenomic sequencing of that CSF, lead to improved uh, diagnosis? So they had a one-year study of 204 patients in eight centres. And all positive tests on metagenomic uh, uh, sequencing was confirmed by orthogonal lab testing. And then what happened was that there was physician feedback via teleconferences with clinical micro-sequencing board and a clinical uh, review through a retrospective chart review to see whether any of this made a difference to the way the patient was treated. Now, in this figure here, you can see the established diagnosis of patients in the, stu it, well, the study patients here. And actually, 57 had an infectious etiology. Now, you see here that there's a proportion of patients who only had a diagnosis through metagenomic sequencing. A, a, a significant proportion actually had positive by conventional testing and by better genomics. What they found, actually, was that of 13 cases diagnosed by metagenomic sequencing alone, half of those had differences in their management and treatment. The interesting thing about this is if we sequence these samples, we have to relearn clinical microbiology. So routine clinical microbiology is looked at through a very narrow lens 
We uh, grow pathogens that we consider are going to cause an infectious disease. Uh, we, it has to be rapid growing, it has to grow in air, and it has to grow on restricted media quite often. And what this does, actually, is really sort of open, I suppose, Pandora's box, because all of a sudden, we're going to find a great number of different pathogens or potential pathogens, and we're going to have to link uh, what the cause, uh, whether there's a cause and effect, what we find in the sequence with the patient syndrome. And I think this is a really exciting time for being a clinical microbiologist, trying to really rediscover microbiology all over again for patient care. My third hot topic is really looking at what we can do if we combine human genomes with pathogen genomes. Now, this isn't straightforward to do, but for SARS-CoV-2, a large number of people had their human genomes, their genomes sequenced, and what is ongoing at the moment is to try and bring together the human and the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes to see if there, you could understand the pathogenesis of disease through an interplay between the two genomes. And so again, I think this is a really exciting area, and, we, and in some ways it's a coming together of the human and the pathogen genomes, which actually diverged at the very beginning of the 100,000 Genome Project. Finally, I think it would be rather interesting if microbes were the arbiter of all human health. It might sound far-fetched, but actually, the gut microbiome is becoming increasingly uh, uh, researched as an important indicator for the way we develop our immune system after we're born, uh, the way we develop chronic diseases, uh, the, whether we, uh, we develop an eating disorder or obesity. There appears to be particular um, gut microbiome signatures for a whole range of diseases. Now, there might be a lot of noise in the system at the moment, um, but actually the idea that the gut microbiome, our own private culture incubator, could actually predict whether you're going to develop a chronic disease, and if you could use the gut microbiome as a diagnostic, also means you could use it as a therapeutic. And so I think we're going to see a huge expansion of work in the gut microbiome, uh, to actually see if we can use it as uh, both a predictive tool for various diseases, not just infectious diseases, and as a therapeutic product. And I think that this story is going to run for many years uh, to come, but is a very exciting one. So finally, the pathogen has revolutionized at attitudes to, to genomics. So pathogen genomes have stepped into the limelight, to say the least, and there's been political and commercial interest. There's been an upswing. People talk about variants, they talk about sequencing um, as common language now. When we went into the pandemic, there was largely centralized sequencing available in the public health agencies, but we now know the value of actually decentralizing and devolving that sequencing. So we have a combination of centralized and devolved sequencing. So for me, Actually, the time is now for expansion of pathogen, pathogen genomics into routine practice. Uh, and I'm glad to have been able to give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the things we can do at the moment, but some of the things that we need to be leaning into in the future. So I'm now going to turn uh, to my thanks, which um, we could not have done this without our funders and supporters. So you'll see here some very familiar faces, um, including Patrick Vallance, Chris Whitty, uh, Mike Stratton, Jeremy Farrow, all of these people really helped us with funding of COG UK and actually gave us the backing to help us do it. These are the people that really made a difference. So here, my, my research group was absorbed into COG UK, and you'll see here uh, some of the people that helped COG UK uh, in terms of the management, uh, the advisory and steering groups and so on. They made a difference um, to getting COG UK going. But actually, it's this slide that's the most important. The 600 people who actually did the work, many um, at, uh, at working on very long hours, and they were quite extraordinary. And it's a humbling uh, for me to stand here and talk about the work that we produced over that period of time. So thank you to them. So thank you for listening, uh, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have.